prayers by the demigods for Lord Krishna in the womb. King Kamsa not only occupied the kingdoms of the Yadu, Bhoja, and Andaka dynasties and the kingdom of Surasena, but he also made alliances with all the other demoniac kings as follows. The demon Pralamba, demon Baka, demon Chanura, demon Chanavarta, demon Agasura, demon Mustika, demon Arista, demon Vivida, demon Putana, demon Keshi, and demon Denuka. At that time, Jarasandha was the king of Magadha province, known at present as Bihar state. Thus, by his diplomatic policy, Kamsa consolidated the most powerful kingdom of his time under the protection of Jarasandha. He made further alliances with such kings as Banasura and Bomasura until he was the strongest. Then he began to behave most inimically toward the Yadu dynasty into which Krishna was to take birth, was to take his birth. Being harassed by Kamsa, the kings of the Yadu, Bhoja, and Andaka dynasties took shelter in different states, such as the state of the Kurus, the state of the Panchalas, and the states known as Kekaya, Shalva, Vidarbha, Nishada, Videha, and Koshala. Kamsa broke the solidarity of the Yadu kingdom, as well as the Bhoja and Andaka. He made his position the most solid within the vast tract of land known at the time as Bharat Varsha. When Kamsa was killing the six babies of Devaki and Vasudev, one after another, many friends and relatives of Kamsa approached him and requested him to discontinue these heinous activities. But all of them became worshippers of Kamsa. When Devaki became pregnant for the seventh time, a plenary expansion of Krishna known as Ananta appeared within her womb. Devaki was overwhelmed with both jubilation and lamentation. She was joyful, for she could understand that Lord Vishnu had taken shelter within her womb. But at the same time, she was sorry that as soon as her child would come out, Kamsa would kill him. At that time, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, being compassionate upon the Yadus, who were fearful due to the atrocities committed by Kamsa, ordered the appearance of Yoga Maya, his internal potency. Krishna is the Lord of the universe, but he is especially the Lord of the Yadu dynasty. Yoga Maya is the principal potency of the personality of Godhead. In the Vedas, it is stated that the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, has multi-potencies. Parasya Shakti Vivideva Shriyate. All the different potencies are acting externally and internally, and Yoga Maya is the chief of all potencies. The Lord ordered the appearance of Yoga Maya in the land of Rajabhumi, in Vrindavan, which is always decorated and full with beautiful cows. In Vrindavan, Rohini, one of the wives of Vasudev, was residing at the house of King Nanda and Queen Yashoda. Not only Rohini, but many others in the Yadu dynasty were scattered all over the country due to their fear of the atrocities of Kamsa. Some of them were even living in the caves of the mountains. The Lord thus informed Yoga Maya, under the imprisonment of Kamsa and Adevaki and Vasudev, and at the present moment, my plenary expansion, Shesha, is within the womb of Devaki. You can arrange the transfer of Shesha from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini. After this arrangement, I am personally going to appear in the womb of Devaki with my full potencies. Then I shall appear as the son of Devaki and Vasudev and you shall appear as the daughter of Nanda and Yashoda in Vrindavan. Since you will appear as my contemporary sister, and since you will quickly satisfy desires for sense gratification, people within the world will worship you with all kinds of valuable presentations, incense, candles, flowers, and offerings of sacrifice. People who are after materialistic perfection will worship you under the different forms of your expansions, which will be named Durga, Adrakali, Vijaya, Vaishnavi, Kumuda, Chandika, Krishna, Madhavi, Kanyaka, Maya, Narayani, Ishani, Sharada, and Ambika. Krishna and Yoga Maya appeared as brother and sister, the supreme powerful and the supreme power. Although there is no clear distinction between the powerful and the power, Power is always subordinate to the powerful. 
Those who are materialistic are worshippers of the power, but those who are transcendental are worshippers of the powerful. Krishna is the supreme powerful and Durga is the supreme power within the material world. Actually, people in the Vedic culture worship both the powerful and the power. There are many hundreds and thousands of temples of Vishnu and Devi, and sometimes they are worshipped simultaneously. The worshipper of the power, Durga, or the external energy of Krishna, may achieve all kinds of material success very easily, but anyone who wants to be elevated transcendentally must engage in worshipping the powerful in Krishna consciousness. The Lord also declared to Yoga Maya, My plenary expansion, Ananta Shesh, is within the womb of Devaki. On account of being forcibly attracted to the womb of Rohini, he will be known as Sankarshan and will be the source of all spiritual power, or Bala, by which one can attain the highest bliss of life, which is called Ramana. Therefore, the plenary portion Ananta will be known after his appearance either as Sankarshan or as Balaram. In the Upanishads, it is stated, Nayam Atma Bala Hine Nalabhya. The purport is that one cannot attain the supreme platform of self-realization without being sufficiently favored by Balaram. Bala does not mean physical strength. No one can attain spiritual perfection by physical strength. One must have the spiritual strength which is infused by Balaram or Sankarshan. Ananta or Shesha is the source of the power which sustains all the planets in their different positions. Materially, the sustaining power is known as the law of gravitation, but actually it is a display of the potency of Sankarshan. Balaram or Sankarshan is the source of spiritual power or the original spiritual master. Therefore, Lord Nityananda Prabhu, who is also the incarnation of Balaram, is the original spiritual master. And the spiritual master is a representative of Balaram, the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who supplies spiritual strength. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is confirmed that the spiritual master is the manifestation of the mercy of Krishna. Thus ordered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Yoga Maya circumambulated the Lord and then appeared within this material world according to his order. When Yoga Maya, the supreme power of the supremely powerful personality of Godhead, transferred Lord Shesha from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini, both Devaki and Rohini were under Yoga Maya's spell which is called Yoga Nidra. When this was done, people thought that Devaki's seventh pregnancy had been a miscarriage. Thus, although Balaram appeared as the son of Devaki, he was transferred to the womb of Rohini to appear as her son. <coughs> After this arrangement, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, who is always ready to protect his unalloyed devotees, entered within the mind of Vasudev as the Lord of the whole creation, with full inconceivable potencies. It is understood in this connection that Lord Krishna first of all situated himself in the unalloyed heart of Vasudev and was then transferred to the heart of Devaki. <coughs> he was not put into the womb of Devaki by seminal discharge. The Supreme Personality of Godhead by his inconceivable potency can appear in any way. It is not necessary for him to appear in the ordinary way by seminal injection within the womb of a woman. When Vasudev was sustaining the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead within his heart, he appeared just like the glowing sun, whose shining rays are always unbearable and scorching to the common man. The form of the Lord situated in the pure unalloyed heart of Vasudev is not different from the original form of Krishna. The appearance of the form of Krishna anywhere, and specifically within the heart, is called Dham. Dharma refers not only to Krishna's form, but also to his name, his qualities, and his paraphernalia. Everything becomes manifest simultaneously. Thus, the eternal form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead with full potencies was transferred from the mind of Vasudev to the mind of Devaki, exactly as the setting sun's rays are transferred to the full moon rising in the east. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, thus entered the body of Devaki from the body of Vasudev without being subject to any of the conditions of an ordinary living entity. Since Krishna was there, it is to be understood that all his plenary expansions such as Narayan and incarnations like Lord Nishinga and Varaha were with him and they also were not subject to the conditions of material existence. 
In this way, Devaki became the residence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is one without a second and the cause of all causes. Devaki became the residence of the Absolute Truth, but because she was confined within the house of Kamsa, she looked just like a suppressed fire or like misused education. When fire is kept in a jug, the illuminating rays of the fire cannot be very much appreciated. Similarly, misused knowledge, which does not benefit the people in general, is not very much appreciated. So Devaki was kept within the prison walls of Kamsa's palace, and no one could see her transcendental beauty, which resulted from her conceiving the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Kamsa, however, saw the transcendental beauty of his sister Devaki, and he had once concluded that the Supreme Personality of Godhead had taken shelter in her womb. She had never before looked so wonderfully beautiful. He could distinctly understand that there was something wonderful within the womb of Devaki. In this way, Kamsa became perturbed because he was sure that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who would kill him in the future, had now come. Kamsa began to think, what is to be done with Devaki? Surely she has Vishnu or Krishna within her womb, so it is certain that Krishna has come to execute the mission of the demigods. And even if I immediately kill Devaki, his mission cannot be frustrated. Kamsa knew very well that no one can frustrate the purpose of Vishnu. Any intelligent man can understand that the laws of God cannot be violated. His purpose will be served in spite of all impediments offered by the demons. Kamsa thought, if I kill Devaki at the present moment, Vishnu will enforce his supreme will more vehemently. To kill Devaki just now would be a most abominable act. No one desires to kill his reputation, even in an awkward situation. If I kill Devaki now, my reputation will be spoiled. Devaki is a woman and she is under my shelter. She is pregnant and if I kill her, immediately my reputation, the results of my pious activities and my duration of life will all be finished. He further deliberated. A person who is too cruel is as good as dead, even in this lifetime. No one likes a cruel person during his lifetime and after his death, people curse him. On account of his self-identification with the body, he must be degraded and pushed into the darkest region of hell. Kamsa thus meditated on all the pros and cons of killing Devaki at this time. Kamsa finally decided not to kill Devaki right away, but to wait for the inevitable future. But his mind became absorbed in animosity against the personality of Godhead. He patiently waited for the delivery of the child, expecting to kill him, as he had done previously with the other babies of Devaki. Thus being merged in the ocean of animosity against the personality of Godhead, he began to think of Krishna or Vishnu while sitting, while sleeping, while walking, while eating, while working, in all the situations of his life. His mind became so much absorbed with the thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead that, he, that indirectly he could see only Krishna or Vishnu around him. Unfortunately, although his mind was so absorbed in the thought of Vishnu, he is not recognized as a devotee because he was thinking of Krishna as an enemy. The state of mind of a great devotee is also to be always absorbed in Krishna, but a devotee thinks of him favorably, not unfavorably. To think of Krishna favorably is Krishna consciousness, but to think of Krishna unfavorably is not Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> At this time, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, accompanied by great sages like Narada and followed by many other demigods, invisibly appeared in the house of Kamsa. They began to pray to the Supreme Personality of Godhead in select verses, which are very pleasing to the devotees and which award fulfillment of their desires. The first words they spoke acclaimed that the Lord is true to his vow. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna descends to this material world just to protect the pious and destroy the impious. That is his vow. The demigods could understand that the Lord had taken his residence within the womb of Devaki to fulfill his vow, and they were very glad that the Lord was appearing in order to fulfill his mission. Then the demigods addressed the Lord as Satyam Param, or the Supreme Absolute Truth. Everyone is searching after the truth. That is the philosophical way of life. The demigods give information that the Supreme Absolute Truth is Krishna. One who becomes fully Krishna conscious can attain the Absolute Truth, Krishna is the absolute truth because, unlike relative truth, he is truth in all the three phases of eternal time. Time is divided into past, present, and future. Krishna is truth always. 
past, present and future. In the material world, everything is being controlled by supreme time in the course of past, present and future. But before the creation, Krishna was existing. And when there is creation, everything is resting in Krishna. And when this creation is finished, Krishna will remain. Therefore, he is the absolute truth in all circumstances. If there is any truth within this material world, it emanates from the supreme truth, Krishna. If there is any opulence within this material world, the cause of the opulence is Krishna. If there is any reputation within this material world, the cause of the reputation is Krishna. If there is any strength within this material world, the cause of such strength is Krishna. If there is any wisdom and education within this material world, the cause of such wisdom and education is Krishna. Therefore, Krishna is a source of all relative truths. This material world is composed of five principal elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And all such elements are emanations from Krishna. The material scientists accept these five primary elements as the cause of the material manifestation. But the elements in their gross and subtle states are produced by Krishna. The living entities who are working within this material world are products of his marginal potency. In the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly stated that the whole manifestation is a combination of two kinds of energies of Krishna, the superior energy and the inferior energy. The living entities are the superior energy and the dead material elements are his inferior energy. In its dormant stage, everything remains in Krishna. The demigods continue to offer their respectful prayers unto the supreme form of the personality of Godhead, Krishna, by analytical study of the material manifestation. What is this material manifestation? It is just like a tree. A tree stands on the ground. Similarly, the tree of the material manifestation is standing on the ground of material nature. This material manifestation is compared to a tree because a tree is ultimately cut off in due course of time. A tree is called vriksha. Vriksha means that thing which will be ultimately cut off. Therefore, this tree of the material manifestation cannot be accepted as the ultimate truth because it is influenced by time. But Krishna's body is eternal. He existed before the material manifestation. He is existing while the material manifestation is continuing. And when it will be dissolved, he will continue to exist. Therefore, only Krishna can be accepted as the absolute truth. The Katha Upanishad also cites this example of the tree of the material manifestation standing on the ground of material nature. This tree has two kinds of fruits, distress and happiness. Those who are living in the tree of the body are just like two birds. One, one bird is the localized aspect of Krishna known as the Paramatma and the other bird is the living entity. The living entity is eating the fruits of this material manifestation. Sometimes he eats the fruit of happiness and sometimes he eats the fruit of distress. But the other bird is not interested in eating the fruit of distress or happiness because he is self-satisfied. The Katha Upanishad states that one bird on the tree of the, of the body is eating the fruits and the other bird is simply witnessing. The roots of this tree extend in three directions. This means that the root of the tree is the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion and ignorance. Just as the tree's root expands, so by association of the modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, one expands his duration of material existence. The tastes of the fruits are four kinds, religiosity, economic development, sense gratification, and ultimately liberation, according to the different associations in the three modes of material nature. The living entities are tasting different kinds of religiosity, different kinds of economic development, different kinds of sense gratification, and different kinds of liberation. Practically all material work is performed in ignorance. But because there are three qualities, sometimes the quality of ignorance is covered with goodness or passion. The taste of these material fruits is accepted through five senses. The five sense organs through which knowledge is acquired are subjected to six kinds of whoops. Lamentation, illusion, infirmity, death, hunger, and thirst. This material body or the material manifestation is covered by seven layers. Muscle, blood, marrow, bone, fat, and semen. The branches of the tree are eight. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego. There are nine gates in this body. 
the two eyes, two nostrils, two ears, one mouth, one genital, one rectum. And there are ten kinds of internal air passing within the body. Prana, apana, udana, vyana, samana, etc. The two birds seated in this tree, as explained above, are the living entity and the localized supreme personality of Godhead, Paramatma. The root cause of the material manifestation described here is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Personality of Godhead expands himself to take charge of the three qualities of the material world. Vishnu takes charge of the mode of goodness, Brahma takes charge of the mode of passion, and Lord Shiva takes charge of the mode of ignorance. Brahma, by the mode of passion, creates this manifestation. Lord Vishnu maintains this manifestation by the mode of goodness and Lord Shiva annihilates it by the mode of ignorance. The whole creation ultimately less, rests in the Supreme Lord. He is the cause of creation, maintenance, and dissolution. And when the whole manifestation is dissolved, in its subtle form as his energy, it rests within his body. At present, the demigods prayed, the Supreme Lord Krishna is appearing just for the maintenance of this manifestation. Actually, the Supreme Cause is one, but less intelligent persons being deluded by the three modes of material nature see that the material world is manifested through different causes. Those who are intelligent can see that the cause is one, Krishna. As it is stated in the Brahma Samhita, Ishvara Parama Krishna, Sarva Karana Karana, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the cause of all causes. Brahma is the deputed agent for creation. Vishnu is the expansion of creation for main, uh, is the expansion of Krishna for maintenance, and Lord Shiva is the expansion of Krishna for dissolution. Mm -hmm. You can hold this. Om Mukhyana Tamirantasya Kananjana Shalakaya Chakshun Miditam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namah Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Jena Putale Shayam Rupa Kodal Maiyam Dadati Shabadantikam Pande Hang Shri Guru Shri Jutapadakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamstra Shri Rupam Shagrasatam Shahagana Raganatan Vitam Stam Sudima Sadvaitam Savatutam Parishana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Shahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamsha He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagat Pate Gopesha Gopita Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kamsana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Shri Prashabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Rama, Rama, Hari, Hari. These prayers are quite substantial, so I thought we might chunk things up a little bit, just as we did with prayers by the personified Vedas. Perhaps you've heard the pastime where Srila Prabhupada was in New Vrindavan for his Pujanvashtami and Vyas Puja, and for the uh, Janvashtami. Prabhupada uh, came and sat in the temple. The temple wasn't very big. I don't know that it was probably a little bigger than this room. Um, yeah, but not huge. And everybody who possibly could crowded in. I also crowded in. And this was the evening, and Prabhupada uh, called for Krishna book to be read. Uh, I don't know what time he began, nine o'clock or something like that. The idea being that you know, reading would go on and on. So they began uh, reading a Krishna book. 
first chapter, the introduction, first chapter, second chapter. And the room now is filled with, with people and everybody's sort of packed in tight and there's people at the windows um, looking in and there's no air. And the devotees are falling asleep. And in particular, the sannyasis were lined up in front of Prabhupada sannyas, uh, Vyasasana. And you could see the, the dundas going like this, <laughs> like dowsing rods, you know. <laughs> and uh, we probably just sat there alert, um, listening to the reading. And, you know, I'm pinching myself and, and uh, doing whatever else I could to, to stay asleep, to stay awake. <laughs> And uh, it's going on and going on and going on. And everybody who felt so fortunate to be in the temple room with Prabhupada by now probably wished they were outside. <laughs> and that finally Prabhupada said, all right, I think you are feeling a little sleepy. <laughs> and he ended the reading. Um, in this chapter, prayers by the personified Vedas. So it's a little substantial, heavy um, philosophy. The, um, we heard, of course, the um, about Kamsa and his mentality, his um, almost bizarre mentality. He knows that this is Vishnu, and that Vishnu can't Vishnu's plans can't be thwarted. But at the same time, he's determined to kill Vishnu. So he's obviously a uh, person who's not thinking clearly, but this is how he's thinking. So we also heard how Krishna arranged with Yoga Maya for Balaram to appear first in the womb of Devaki, and then for Yoga Maya to transfer him to the womb of Rohini. So when that happened, everyone thought that Devaki had had a miscarriage, um, but this was Yogamaya's arrangement. And Krishna told Yogamaya that you'll also appear as my contemporary sister. Uh -huh. So these, the setup is there, and then Krishna appeared in the womb of Devaki, transferred from the, the heart or mind of Vasudev to the heart or mind of um, Devaki. And the demigods all knew that Krishna is there, so they assemble in the prison house and they offer these prayers to the unseen personality of Godhead. Here we hear that the Lord is like a, uh, that the body of the living entities are like a, is like a tree and the details of the tree are described metaphorical tree of the body with all its various components and um, then we hear that the uh, lord and the super soul are both there uh, and that the lord is the cause of the whole uh, creation He's the cause, he's the maintainer, he's the annihilator. Uh, he's present in all three phases of time, but uh, those who are not Krishna conscious are unable to see him. Only the devotees can see that behind everything is, is the arrangement of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Any questions or comments so far? Tulsi? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, do, do you know when exactly a Yoga Ma is appearing as a daughter of Devaki and Vasudeva? Because she's smaller than Krishna, so should be after that. She's smaller. Means, means she's the younger sister of. Oh, I see. Of Krishna. 
Well, we hear that when the that Yoga Maya or, or uh, Turga is switched for Krishna uh, by Vasudeva, that he goes to um, the across the river and brings back the daughter of Yashodamai. So, more or less contemporaneous, but as much as I know. Anyone know more? Okay. And she appears, as mentioned in the text, and she's known by so many different names. As we find today, there's uh, so many names of Turga. And she's worshipped by so many people for material wounds. Uh, Marad, this here it was written that this material world is like a tree. So the body is compared to a tree. Yes. Body is compared to a tree. The body is, but in Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Yeah. We're from Mula Yeah. Lots of things are compared to trees. Trees are easily available and for comparison. Uh, so you can compare the material world to a tree, you can compare the body to a tree. I'm sure there are many other things you can compare to a tree. So this spiritual world is a is also a tree whose perverted reflection is this material world. Mm. But we as a living entity, we are thinking that this perverted reflection, it is the real thing. And then our existence is there. We are trying to. So even if we, even if we like, truly identified that this is the real tree, spiritual trees, is still. The reflection will still exist. Yeah, because you're not the only living entity in existence. So as we exist in a spiritual world, so the. Our perverted existence should there be in the material world also? Is it like this? Mm -hmm. No, it's not that when you exist in the spiritual world, you have some sort of uh, materially perverted counterpart who's uh, dragging on in the material world. No. No. You go back to Godhead, back to the spiritual world. That's it. No, uh, no shadow at Hokshuja. Um, still hanging out here, you're gone. So again, metaphors are not exactly literal, literal, you know, it's not that if there's a perverted uh, reflection of a tree, it has to exact, the, the metaphor has to carry through to every aspect of, of existence. It's to give us an idea. Also, Marad, like here, not that everything in the spiritual world has to be reflected here. And especially you don't have to be reflected here. So here, Mara, different things are of material world are mentioned and it is said that, uh, like this is statement, if there is any truth within this material world, it emanates from the super, Supreme Truth Krishna. If there is any opulence in the material world, it is, and then at the end it is written, Krishna is the source of all relative truths. So if if Krishna, from Krishna these uh, relative truths are coming, but Krishna is absolute truth. So why they are called relative truth? They should be absolute truth, because if the source is absolute, then the product is also absolute. No. They, just like... <clears throat> You're standing in the sunshine and you have a shadow. Hmm? So the your your body is the truth and the shadow is uh, relative to your body. If you raise your hand, your shadow raises your hand, raises its hand. If you turn, the shadow turns. If you move, the shadow moves. So the shadow is relative to you. But they, 
the shadow doesn't have the same substantiality that you have. Even though you're substantial, your shadow is not substantial. So even though the personality of Godhead is the ultimate substance, the material world is not substantial. Even though it, it uh, resembles in some ways the, the absolute truth. The, that's also the potency of the absolute truth, that he can manifest relative truths. Hmm? Finally, everything is relative to the personality of Godhead. Everything is dependent on the personality of Godhead. The personality of Godhead is independent. Everything else is dependent. In that sense, everything is relative to Krishna. We're all thinking that we're independent in that sense that we're absolute truths you know that we're we independently exist we can do as we like and it's not true we're dependent so we're relative relative to whom relative to vision so maharaj is this statement right that we are absolute relative to krishna <laughs> Is this statement right that we're absolute relative to Krishna? <laughs> um, it's an interesting statement. It would provide lots of fun for people who want to uh, mess around with grammar and and semantics and so on. What do you mean by that we're absolute relative to Krishna? That means uh, we we also like our relationship with Krishna is also eternal. With time, place, circumstance, it does not change. But if we see it in terms of Krishna, yeah, so that way, yeah, we we have the same qualities as Krishna. So in that sense, we have absolute existence. We're eternal. We're blissful. We're full of knowledge. But we're dependent on Krishna. As Prabhupada said. There's no difference, no clear difference, he said, between the powerful and the power. Um, so we're also powers of Krishna. So in that sense, we're uh, identical with Krishna, but we're dependent on Krishna. And also we're tiny in size. Is that all right? Anything else? Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Um, we often hear that example of two birds in a tree. Mm -hmm. One is busy and the other one is witnessing. Mm -hmm. Paramatma is witnessing. Um, but I was wondering, doesn't Paramatma also take an active role in the relationship, the interaction between the soul and its interaction with matter, mm -hmm. checking with its karma? The distinction between the two made there is that the one bird is, is eating fruits of the tree. The other bird's not eating. The little bird, the, the, the living entity bird, is busy eating the fruits of material life, sometimes bitter, sometimes fruit, uh, sweet. But the other bird, Krishna, he's not uh, sampling the fruits of this tree to see whether they're enjoyable or not enjoyable. Uh, he's watching. But yes, he also takes part. He gives knowledge, um, forgetfulness, remembrance. So he's not just entirely, he's not inactive. But he's, he has no business with um, taking part in trying to enjoy the material world. Is that okay? Anything else? Let us read on.
<clears throat> Our dear Lord, the demigods prayed, it is very difficult to understand your eternal form or personality. People in general are unable to understand your actual form. Therefore, you are personally descending to exhibit your original eternal form. Somehow people can understand the different incarnations of your Lordship, but they are puzzled to understand the eternal form of Krishna with two hands, moving among human beings exactly like one of them. This eternal form of your Lordship gives ever-increasing transcendental pleasure to the devotees, but for the non-devotees, this form is very dangerous. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is very pleasing to the sadhus, paritranaya sadhunam. But this form is very dangerous for the demons because Krishna also descends to kill the demons. He is therefore simultaneously pleasing to the devotees and dangerous to the demons. Our dear lotus-eyed Lord, you are the source of pure goodness. There are many great sages who simply by samadhi or transcendentally meditating upon your lotus feet and thus being absorbed in your thought, have easily transformed the great, great ocean of nescience created by the material nature into no more than the water in a calf's hoof print. The purpose of meditation is to focus the mind upon the personality of Godhead, beginning from his lotus feet. Simply by meditation on the lotus feet of the Lord, great sages cross over this vast ocean of material existence without difficulty. O self-illuminated one, the great saintly persons who have crossed over the ocean of nescience by the help of the transcendental boat of your lotus feet have not taken away that boat. It is still lying on this side. If one takes a boat to cross over a river, the boat also goes with one to the other side of the river. And so when one reaches the destination, how can the same boat be available to those who are still on this side? To answer this difficulty, the demigods say in their prayer that the boat of the Lord's lotus feet is not taken away. The devotees still remaining on this side are able to pass over the ocean of material nature because the pure devotees do not take the boat with them when they cross over. When one simply approaches the boat, the whole ocean of material nescience is reduced to the size of the water in a calf's hoof print. Therefore, the devotees do not need to take the boat to the other side they simply cross the ocean immediately. Because the great saintly persons are compassionate toward all conditioned souls, the boat is still lying on the side. In other words, one can meditate upon the lotus feet of the Lord at any time, and by so doing, one can cross over the great ocean of material existence. Meditation means concentration upon the lotus feet of the Lord. Lotus feet indicate the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But those who are impersonalists do not recognize the lotus feet of the Lord, and therefore their object of meditation is something impersonal. The demigods express their mature verdict that persons who are interested in meditating on something void or impersonal cannot cross over the ocean of nescience. Such persons are simply imagining that they have become liberated. O oh, lotus-eyed Lord, their intelligence is contaminated because they fail to meditate upon the lotus feet of your Lordship. As a result of this neglectful activity, the impersonalists fall down again into the material way of conditioned life, although they may temporarily rise to the point of impersonal realization. Impersonalists undergo severe austerities and penances to merge themselves into the Brahman effulgence or impersonal Brahman existence. But their minds are not free from material contamination. They have simply tried to negate the material ways of thinking. That does not mean that they have become liberated. Thus, they fall down. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that the impersonalist has to undergo great tribulation in realizing his ultimate goal. At the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is also stated that without devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one cannot achieve liberation from the bondage of fruit of activities. The statement of Lord Krishna is there in the Bhagavad Gita. And in Srimad Bhagavatam, the statement of the great sage Narada is there. And here also the demigods confirm it. Persons who have not taken to devotional service are understood to have come short of the ultimate purpose of knowledge and are not favored by your grace. The impersonalists simply think that they are liberated. But actually they have no feeling for the personality of Godhead. They think that when Krishna comes into the material world, he accepts a material body. They therefore overlook the transcendental body of Krishna. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Avajananti ma mudha. 
In spite of conquering material lust and rising to the point of liberation, the impersonalists fall down. If they are engaged just in knowing things for the sake of knowledge and do not take to the devotional service of the Lord, they cannot achieve the desired result. Their achievement is the trouble they take, and that is all. It is clearly stated in the Bhagavad Gita that to realize Brahman identification is not all. Brahman identification may help one become joyful without material attachment or detachment and to achieve the platform of equanimity. But after this stage, one has to take to devotional service. When one takes to devotional service after being elevated to the platform of Brahman realization, he is then admitted into the spiritual kingdom for permanent residence in association with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the result of devotional service. Those who are devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead never fall down like the impersonalists. Even if the devotees fall down, they remain affectionately attached to their Lord. They can meet all kinds of obstacles on the path of devotional service and freely, without any fear, they can surmount such obstacles. Because of their surrender, they are certain that Krishna will always protect them. As it is promised by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, my devotees are never vanquished. Yeh nye rubindaksha vimukta manina vayasta bhava avishuddha buddhaya yeh nye chapapa yadre ashrani erupashra ashraya nostra <laughs> oh put two verses together like that vayasta bhava avishuddha buddhaya aruya krishna parampanam tata patantyano Sri the Prabhupada quotes this verse very often um, because it accurately portrays the difficulties faced by those on the impersonal path. They go through so much trouble to attain liberation and they may even think that they're liberated, but because they haven't come to the platform of healthy life, of devotional service, um, they neglect the lotus feet of the Lord, and they fall down. Uh, they fall down after undergoing so much trouble. Uh, but the devotees um, probably gave the example that um, like a rocket or a satellite is orbiting, but if it has no shelter, again, it comes under the gravitational field the earth or some other planet. So very important verse um, here uh, in this in the prayers by the demigods. Anything about this? No. Good. Our oh, dear Lord, the demigods continued, you have appeared in your original unalloyed form, the eternal form of goodness for the welfare of all living entities within this material world. Taking advantage of your appearance, all of them can now very easily understand the nature and form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Persons who belong to the four divisions of the social order, the brahmacharis, grihastas, vanaprastas, and sannyasis can all take advantage of your appearance. Dear Lord, husband of the goddess of fortune, devotees who are dovetailed in your service do not fall down from their high position like the impersonalists. Being protected by you, the devotees are able to traverse over the heads of many of Maya's commanders in chief, who can always put stumbling blocks on the path of liberation. Dear Lord, you appear in your eternal transcendental form for the benefit of the living entities so that they can see you face to face and offer their worshipful sacrifices by ritualistic performance of the Vedas, mystic meditation and devotional service as recommended in the scriptures. Dear Lord, if you do not appear in your eternal transcendental form, full of bliss and knowledge, a form which can eradicate all kinds of speculative <laughs> ignorance about your position, then all people would simply speculate about you according to their respective modes of material nature. The appearance of Krishna is the answer to all imaginative iconography of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Everyone imagines the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead according to his mode of material nature. In the Brahma Samhita, it is said that the Lord is the oldest person. 
Therefore, a section of religionists imagine that God must be very old, and therefore they depict a form of the Lord like a very old man. But in the same Brahma Samhita, that is contradicted. Although he is the oldest of all living entities, he has his eternal form as a fresh youth. The exact words used in this connection in Srimad Bhagavatam are Vigyanam Ajnana Bida Pam Arjun, Arjunam. Vigyana means transcendental knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vigyanam is also experienced knowledge. Transcendental knowledge has to be accepted by the descending process of disciplic succession as Brahma presents the knowledge of Krishna in the Brahma Samhita. The Brahma Samhita is Vigyanam as realized by Brahma's transcendental experience. And in that way, he presented the form and the pastimes of Krishna in the transcendental abode. This knowledge is Ajnana Bidapam Arjanam, that which can smash all kinds of speculation and ignorance. <clears throat> People are imagining the form of the Lord. Sometimes he has no form and sometimes he has form, according to their different imaginations. But the presentation of Krishna and the Brahma Samhita is Vigyanam, scientific, experienced knowledge given by Lord Brahma and accepted by Lord Chaitanya. There is no doubt about it. Krishna's form, Krishna's flute, Krishna's color, everything is reality. Here it is said that this Vijnanam is always defeating all kinds of speculative knowledge. Therefore, without you appearing as Krishna, as you are, neither ajnana bida pam arjanam, destruction of this nescience of speculative knowledge, no vijnana would be realized. In other words, your appearance will vanquish the ignorance of speculative knowledge and establish the real experienced knowledge of authorities like Lord Brahma. Men are influenced by the three modes of material nature. Men influenced by the three modes of material nature imagine their own God according to the modes of material nature. In this way, God is presented in various ways, but your appearance will establish what the real form of God is. <coughs> The highest blunder committed by the impersonalist is to think that when the incarnation of God comes, he accepts the form of matter in the mode of goodness. Actually, the form of Krishna or Narayan is transcendental to any material idea. Even the greatest impersonalist, Sankaracharya, has admitted, Narayana paro vyaktat, the material creation is caused by the avyakta, impersonal manifestation of matter, or the non-phenomenal total reservoir of matter. But Krishna is transcendental to that material conception. That is expressed in Srimad Bhagavatam as Shuddha Sattva, or transcendental goodness. He does not belong to the material mode of goodness, and he is above the position of material goodness. He belongs to the transcendental eternal status of bliss and knowledge. Dear Lord, when you appear in your different incarnations, you take different names and forms according to different situations. Lord Krishna is your name because you are all attractive. You are called Shama Sundar because of your transcendental beauty. Shama means blackish, yet it is said that you are more beautiful than thousands of cupids, Kandarpa Koti Kamaniya. Although you appear in a color which is compared to the blackish cloud, because you are the transcendental absolute, your beauty is many, many times more attractive than the delicate body of Cupid. Sometimes you are called Giridhari because you lifted the hill known as Govardhan. You are sometimes called Nanda Nandana or Vasudev or Devaki Nandana because you appear as the son of Maharaj Nanda or Vasudev or Devaki. Impersonalists think that your, your many names or forms are given according to a particular type of work and quality because they accept you from the position of a material observer. Our dear Lord, the way of understanding is not to study your absolute nature, form and activities by mental speculation. One must engage himself in devotional service. Then one can understand your absolute nature and your transcendental form, names and qualities. Actually, only a person who has a little taste for the service of your lotus feet can understand your transcendental nature or form and qualities. Others may go on speculating for millions of years but it is not possible for them to understand even a single part of your actual position. In other words, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, cannot be understood by the non-devotees because there is a curtain of yoga maya which covers Krishna's actual features. As confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, Naham Prakasha Sarvasya, the Lord says, I am not exposed to anyone and everyone. 
When Krishna came, he was actually present on the battlefield of Kurukshetra and everyone saw him. But not everyone could understand that he was the supreme personality of Godhead. Still, everyone who died in his presence attained complete liberation from material bondage and was transferred to the spiritual world. O oh Lord, the impersonalists or non-devotees cannot understand that your name is identical with your form. Since the Lord is absolute, there is no difference between his name and his actual form. In the material world, there is a difference between form and name. The mango fruit is different from the name of the mango. One cannot taste the mango fruit simply by chanting, mango, mango, mango. But the devotee who knows that there is no difference between the name and the form of the Lord chants, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, and realizes that, there is, that he is always in Krishna's company. For persons who are not very advanced in absolute knowledge of the Supreme, Lord Krishna exhibits his transcendental pastimes. Such persons can simply think of the pastimes of the Lord and get full benefit. Since there is no difference between the transcendental name and form of the Lord, there is no difference between the transcendental pastimes and the form of the Lord. For those who are less intelligent, like women, laborers, or the mercantile class, the great sage Vyasadeva wrote the Mahabharata. In the Mahabharata, Krishna is pre present in his different activities. The Mahabharata is history, and simply by studying, hearing, and memorizing the transcendental activities of Krishna, the less intelligent can also gradually rise to the standard of pure devotees. The pure devotees, who are always absorbed in the thought of the transcendental lotus feet of Krishna, and who are always engaged in devotional service in full Krishna <coughs> consciousness, are never to be considered to be in the material world. Srila Rupa Goswami has explained that those who are always engaged in Krishna consciousness with body, mind, and activities are to be considered liberated even within this body. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Those who are engaged in the devotional service of the Lord have already transcended the material position. Krishna appears in order to give a chance to both the devotees and the non-devotees for realization of the ultimate goal of life. The devotees get the direct chance to see him and worship him. Those who are not on that platform get the chance to become acquainted with his activities and thus become elevated to the same position. Our dear Lord, O Supreme Controller, when you appear on, the, on earth, all the demons like Kamsa and Jarasandha will be vanquished and all good fortune will be ushered into the world. When you walk on the globe, your lotus feet will impress on the ground the marks of your souls, such as the flag, the trident and the thunderbolt. Thus you will grace both the earth and us on the heavenly planets, who shall see those marks. O oh dear Lord, the demigods continued, you are unborn, therefore we do not find any reason for your appearance other than for your pleasurable pastimes. Although the reason for the appearance of the Lord is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, he descends just to give protection to the devotees and vanquish the non-devotees, actually he descends for his pleasure meeting with the devotee, for his pleasure meeting with the devotees, not really to vanquish the non-devotees. The non-devotees can be vanquished simply by one kick of material nature. The actions and reactions of material nature, creation, maintenance, and annihilation, are being carried out automatically. But simply by taking shelter of your holy name, the devotees are fully protected because your holy name and your personality are non-different. The protection of the devotees and the annihilation of the non-devotees are actually not the business of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When he descends, it is just for his transcendental pleasure. There cannot be any other reason for his appearance. Our dear Lord, you are appearing as the best of the Yadu dynasty, and we are offering our respectful, humble obeisances unto your lotus feet. Before this appearance, you also appeared as the fish incarnation, as the horse incarnation, as the tortoise incarnation, as the half man, half lion incarnation, as the boar incarnation, as the swan incarnation, as King Ramachandra, as Parashurama, <coughs> and as many other incarnations. You appear just to protect the devotees, and we request you in your present appearance as the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself to give us similar protection all over the three worlds and remove all obstacles for the peaceful execution of our lives. Dear Mother Devaki, within your womb is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, appearing, 
along with all his plenary expansions. He is the original personality of Godhead, appearing for our welfare. Therefore, you should not be afraid of your brother, the king of Boja. Your son, Lord Krishna, who is the original personality of Godhead, will appear for the protection of the pious Yadu dynasty. The Lord is appearing not alone, but accompanied by his immediate plenary portion, Baladev. Devaki was very much afraid of her brother Kamsa because he had already killed so many of her children. So she was very anxious about Krishna. In the Vishnu Purana, it is stated that in order to pacify Devaki, all the demigods, along with their wives, used to visit her to encourage her not to be afraid that her son would be killed by Kamsa. Krishna, who was within her womb, was to appear not only to diminish the burden of the world, but specifically to protect the interests of the Yadu dynasty and certainly to protect Devaki and Vasudev. It is understood that Krishna had been transferred from the mind of Vasudev to the mind of Devaki and from there to her womb. Thus all the demigods worshipped Devaki, the mother of Krishna. After thus worshipping the transcendental form of the Lord, all the demigods with Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva placed in front departed for their heavenly abodes. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the second chapter of Krishna. Prayers by the demigods for Lord Krishna in the womb. Glory. Any questions, comments? Hmm. Hold on, we're giving you a microphone. <clears throat> Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Can you elaborate a little on the distinction between transcendental goodness and material goodness, which is which is not tinged with mode of passion and ignorance? No, there's no difference. So <coughs> transcendental goodness, if goodness is not mixed tinged. with passion and ignorance, it's called Vishuddha Sattva. That's transcendental. It's not found in the material world. And second question was, Maharaj, about this is naturally bewildering that Krishna himself comes in the four-handed form before Devaki. And despite it, she continues to feel afraid that he will be killed. Mm -hmm. So how do we reconcile that on, on the one hand, the Lord himself is giving assurance. And on the other hand, Devaki appears to be falling into... This is almost the flip side of, of uh, what we were hearing before about Kamsa. Kamsa knew that it's Vishnu who's going to appear. He can't. His plan can't be thwarted, but I have to kill him. <laughs> and here Devaki is thinking that he's Vishnu, he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but Kamsa might kill him. <laughs> So this is Yoga Maya acting uh, both ways, um, bewildering uh, Kamsa because of his demonic mentality, and at the same time, um, you could say bewildering Devaki or or covering his transcendental nature, so, um, so that she can feel uh, transcendental motherly affection for Krishna. This is her relationship. So on the one side, she sees it's Vishnu. He's the personality of Godhead. Uh, and then Krishna expands his yoga maya. And she thinks, but I have to protect him from Kamsa. Um, that same sort of activity by yoga maya we see when Krishna showed the universal form within his mouth Shonamai is thinking, and what is this? Uh, I'm seeing, what am I seeing? And she starts philosophizing that uh, by the illusory energy of the Lord, I'm thinking that I'm the queen of, of Nanda, that all these coward people are my subjects, that Krishna is my son. Uh, and then the next minute, uh, Yoga Maya comes in and covers all that. All right, don't do it again. Well, this is yoga mind, always acting 
in such a way as to preserve and enhance the transcendental relationship between Krishna and his devotees. Um, when Krishna is stealing brother, if if Yashoda Mai is thinking uh, this is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then she has to worship him with awe and reverence. But because Yoga Maya um, helps, she's thinking this boy is too mischievous, he needs to be punished or at least threatened with punishment. Is that okay? Anything more about this? Yes, to see. Hare Krishna. A few things I wanted to ask. One is, uh, so it looks like demigods, they were there offering prayers and the vacuum vessel there, they were seeing them. It doesn't say that exactly. Um, although it does say that the demigods came to encourage. Um, and one of the prayers is, yeah, Dear Mother Devaki, within your womb is the same. Yeah, yeah, it does say that. Um, although that doesn't necessarily mean that she heard the prayers. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that she heard the prayers, that they were um, intended for her. But it does say um, that the demigods used to visit her to encourage her not to fear that her son would be killed by Krishna. Um, in fact, that's in the verse. Uh, let's see. Mabhut Bayam Pojapate Mumur Sho. you don't you have no need to fear. Um uh, So yes, it does appear that um the demigods were in one way or another uh, manifest to Devaki. That was amazing. The jail and Devaki and Vasu Devan. Who knows how many demigods? <laughs> yeah, quite the jail. <laughs> also, I wanted to ask, uh, it was mentioned that uh, everybody who was present on the battlefield of, battlefield of Kurukshetra got liberated. Mm -hmm. So does that mean like all the soldiers or those who were seeing Krishna when they were dying? Mm -hmm. Everyone. Either they were purified by seeing Krishna, or they were purified by the arrows of uh, Arjuna and so on. Sometimes it's said that those on the opposite side were more fortunate because they could see Krishna. Krishna was there facing uh, many times Prabhupada said they were all those who were more fortunate less fortunate attained at least mukti, and those who were more fortunate attained the kingdom of God. Something else? Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, <clears throat> during the course of the narration, we heard uh, a statement that uh, Srila Prabhupada makes in terms of like the appearance of Krishna puts an end to all the speculative... Um, uh, not iconography, I think. I think he said iconography. Iconography, yes. Mm. He uses that word in terms of who the Lord is. Now, is this statement meant to be for those that claim to be gods themselves or in terms of other religions also? Uh, no, not just those, but those speculative iconography means they have some picture, some idea of God, uh, but it's not because they really know. They speculate and think it probably gives the example. And of course, it's the, uh, you see this in the Sistine Chapel, the, uh, the, the picture of the, uh, wise old god with his beard and his creased face um reaching out and 
uh, giving a spark of life to Adam. So it's a speculation. There's no description in the Bible that God um, has a beard and a creased face and he's an old man. But, um, well, God was there before everything, so he must be really old. He's the father, our father who art in heaven, so he's the father. Fathers are at least a little old, um, and so on. So um, the artist speculates, which is what artists do. <laughs> they picture things in their mind and think, it must look like this, it must look like that. And then you get whole generations of, of people who think that think of God and then they they, they see Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel God in their minds. So that's speculative <clears throat> iconography. There may be other speculations about what God looks like or what God is what kind of form God has. So um, it's not because Michelangelo has that picture that God must be like that. Um, but the, the Brahma Sangita gets explicit. He's uh, Adya Purana, Purana Purusham. He's the oldest person. But Navayovanamcha, he's always youthful. And so, and then we get Barahavatam uh, Samasitam, Buddha Sandarangam. He's wearing a peacock feather and so on and so on. So it gets quite explicit. And therefore, Prabhupada is. As we mentioned, he guided the artists in the details of the various paintings uh, with reference to Shastra. That the Krishna looks like this, and um, Radharani looks like that, and the Gopis look like this, and so on. So that we don't need to speculate. Okay. Thank you. Another point I wanted to make, there was, um, again, uh, during the narration, a part where... Uh, Mother Devaki uh, is described as suppressed fire, I think. Yeah. And something about knowledge. Uh, uh, misused. Misused knowledge. Misused knowledge. Okay. Um, isn't this the condition of like most people in the world where they're maybe they're um, um, divine kind of like aspect is suppressed because of the the situation in the world, you know, the government and, uh, you know, the atmosphere in Kali Yuga. Well, certainly that doesn't help. Um, but people also cover their own divine nature by their uh, own determination to enjoy material energy, by their own lust, their own anger, and so on. So you have sort of cooperation between the materialistic uh, people and materialistic le leaders, mm -hmm. both of them contributing to that, that effect. And of course, the text is not about that. The text is just metaphorical, that as, as fire might be covered by something, so, or knowledge might be covered. So Devaki's beauty was covered from the view of the people um, because she was in prison. But your your uh, what you've extracted is also true. Thank you. Thank you. Something else? Yes. Um, I guess. Um, it was said that Sankaracharya said, material creation is caused by the impersonal manifestation of matter, but Krishna is transcendental to that material conception. And obviously the second part of that statement is correct. I was wondering, is there also truth to the first part or is he saying that to dilute no. people? Because mostly we say that material creation is caused by the, the glance of Vishnu or by Brahma. There's a vipto vyakta sanatana. Prastasma tu bhavonyo vyakto vyakta sanatana in the Bhagavad Gita. The material... <laughs> Nature is sometimes manifest and sometimes unmanifest. Sometimes it takes the form of the active material world, and sometimes the material elements are, um, say, in reserve. 
there mm -hmm. they exist but they exist in an inactive form so that's called a vyakta mm -hmm. and the shankara says narayana para avyakta um, narayana is above that um, the, the impersonalists say that the form of God is a manifestation of, of matter. But sometimes they say of total goodness, or sometimes they say of total ignorance. Yeah? Am I right, Gopinath? Yeah. Um, the, they have these ideas like, like that. But even Shankara, impersonalist number one, he says, no, Narayan is para avyakta. He's beyond even the unmanifest material nature. Hmm? So he can't be a product of material nature because he's beyond it. Um, but then when that uh, matter is in an unmanifested state, dormant hmm. state, then that's not a cause yet. Right, because mm -hmm. he's saying material creation is caused by the impersonal manifestation of matter. Well, yeah, but it gets activated. Let's see. Let me go back to where you're reading, um, or I can pick it up from here. I guess. Mm. Or can I? Mm. Yeah, I guess it's 28. Where am I reading? It's hard for me to find this, actually. There it is. Okay. The highest blunder committed by the impersonalist is to think that when, when the incarnation of God comes, he accepts the form of matter and the mode of goodness. Hmm? But the form of Krishna is, or Narayana is transcendental to any material idea. Even Shankara has admitted the material creation is caused by the avyakta, the impersonal manifestation of matter, or the non phenomenal total reservoir of matter. So that's called pradhan. Matter has two aspects, pradhan and prakriti. Pra pradhan means the total aggregate of the material ingredients, but inactive. Nothing's happening. My This is not shastric, but I always think of it as like a warehouse of the material elements. You know, they're, they're all... Uh, reserved there, probably, I think, uses the word conserved. Um, but they're not doing anything. They're inactive. But then the Lord casts his glance in the form of time over the material nature. Material nature starts to cook. Material nature gets active. Um, and starts to bubble and, and uh, you know, things happen. Um, and it's described how this is third canto, how the elements appear one after another, how um, the material nature unfolds. And so you get the, the um, false ego, and then you get in three different modes of nature, and you get the demigods, you get the mind, you get the intelligence, you get the um, senses, active senses, the uh, knowledge gathering senses, you get the sense objects, uh, you get all these things appearing before Brahma even does anything. The first creation by the Lord is the creation of all these uh, material ingredients. You know, it's like uh, you hire a contractor, but first you buy all the stuff and have it on site. <clears throat> so Krishna has everything on site, and then Brahma yeah, is brought in, and he he uh, builds. The, the universes and you know, provides the bodies for the living entities and so on. Um, but everything, the Prakriti Kriyamana, 
you know, we're all under the sway of prakriti, the active material nature. But the inactive material nature is exactly that, inactive. It doesn't do anything. It, it sits. Um, because time has not yet entered. Prabhupada gave the example. We've been discussing this. This is an advertisement in my uh, in Bhagavatam classes, in the, which in Vrindavan don't really work. They're at 5.30 in the morning. Um, but they're reserved on YouTube. We're studying three days a week, Srimad Bhagavatam. So we're in this, okay. We've passed that, recently passed that section of Srimad Bhagavatam, describing how this all happens in the third canto. Of course, there are other sections that repeat the same information. But this all happens uh, because of time. And Prabhupada gives the example that you have a pot sitting on a stove with water on it, water in it, and you have a flame, but nothing happens unless you add time. The pot is there, the fire is there, the water is there, but nothing happens unless you add time. Boil three minutes and you know, all of that. Without time, Nothing's, nothing's going to happen, um, whatever it might be, whatever you might, any action. It's not going to happen unless there's time. So the pradhan is material nature before time enters the picture. And therefore, it's totally inactive. Without time, nothing happens. And when the Lord glances over material nature, his energy in the form of time, gets everything going. So this mm, inactive material ma nature is unmanifest. Of your, is that okay? Just to confirm if I understood right. So in this statement, Sankaracharya, he is stating that that cause of a material creation is impersonal time. Because it seems no. like he's saying no, he, he's not saying that. Yeah. Oh, uh, no. Uh, creation, the the active creation is caused by the in inactive material elements. That's what he's saying. But that doesn't make sense. No, it's true. The this material, the active material nature. If you look behind that, you'll find the inactive material nature. So he, he's not wrong. But by what process does the inactive material nature get activated? I don't know what he says for, for that, but um, in any case, um, he, he's not wrong. The cause of, of Prakriti is Pratan. Pratan is Prakriti in an inactive form. So he's, he's not wrong there. But, um, and he's certainly right here that beyond the Pratan is, is Narayan. And isn't it strange that then we take the first part of a statement as being half the truth, and then the second part no, we take the whole full statement truth? is true. That behind that the complete? material, behind the active material nature, is the unmanifest material nature, and beyond manifest material nature is Narayan. Beyond beyond the unmanifest material, the, the whole statement is true. Shankar Charya gets gets a call. Padre Narayan Mar said his, his father used to say even a stopped clock is right two times a day. <laughs> so we're totally on board with Shankara Charja on this one. We agree. Okay, we can stop here. Do you want to leave Kirtan today, Tulsi? Should we have Tulsi leave? Krishna, 
Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, 
Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. 
Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Swami Raj Krupa Diki Jai Ananta Koti Vaishnavrinda Ki Jai Nama Charja Shilhari Das Thakur Ki Jai Prem Sikaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adhita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gokopinath Sham Kun Radha Kun Dikiri Govardhan Ki Jai Vrindavan Tham Ki Jai, Navadip Tham Ki Jai, Jagannath Puri Ki Jai, Ganga Mai Ki Jai, Jamana Mai Ki Jai, Tulsi Devi Ki Jai, Bhakti Devi Ki Jai, Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. Gaur Premanande. Much for coming. Please take some prasadam on the way out. For those who are interested, my book is available in an unmanifest state today. <laughs> and there, uh, yeah. Thank you all very much. Hare Krishna. <laughs>